Welcome to the show. We hope you have a blast. Thanks for making time for the Dealer Talk Podcast. Another business leader, here's a penny for your thoughts. This ain't a regular conversation, baby. This that Dealer Talk. Yeah, this that Dealer Talk. What up? Welcome back to another episode of the Dealer Talk Podcast, Season 7, Episode 3. What is going on? Let me check in with my co host, Miss Charity Ann. What's up? What is up? Hi. How are you doing today? So you're not as, you know, you got to have some energy, man. Like I'm like all like, welcome to the dealer talk. And you're like, hi, hello. Okay. So next time I'll be like, hi, everybody. And you can be like, I'm whatever. Hi. Yeah. You got to be like pumped. You're like, you remind me of that guy that does the actor studio. Like, hello, everybody. Welcome to. I totally thought you were going to say that I reminded you of the kid on Horton and Here's a Who, the angry teenager. What? Uh, you don't know that don't know reference like that reference but not me anyway. <laughs> um, oh you're missing out yes yes what, what, anyway what, what's the guy's name john Lit- litkin or something like that Lit- Lit- see i don't know yeah. your reference the actor studio that interviews all like the actors with the beard and stuff nope no see we don't anyway it's like when you don't even know each other we're gonna we're gonna keep moving forward. We're not gonna cut this out. Let's just you know, <laughs> put it out there. Let's see what happens. So, dude, I'm super stoked for today's episode. For today's guest, we got Mr. Jim Flynn in the house. I'm so excited. This dude's got an amazing book called Car Dog Millionaire. It's awesome. It's pretty highly, good. highly suggest that you recommend that, that you recommend. I highly suggest that you check it out. <laughs> we're recommending it. You're checking it out. And then you're recommending it afterwards. Yes. Afterwards, you're going to recommend it because it's amazing. No, seriously, like when it comes to marketing for, for, for the automotive space, I think that book is spot on. It's got a lot of good insights. Um, and I feel like a lot of that stuff is applicable today, even though he, you know, I remember reading it when I was like, just left uh, training for Cox Automotive. It was just uh, released down into the field. Um, for uh, when I was with Auto Trader, and um, you know, a lot of that stuff, those are concepts that kind of built in my mind back then, and I've developed those as the years have progressed. So, um, yeah, I'm super. I stoked remember when I first read Car Dog Millionaire? Yeah, not I that told long you to read ago. It. Yeah, yeah, you did. You got that's that book. You got to reread it because the first time you read it. There's so much valuable information in there that you're like, whoa, like you want to take it all. So you got to read it at least three times to really. And every time I went back, I've read it like seven times at this point. But every time I've gone back to read it, I was like, oh, man, I, I didn't pick this up. And I'm uh, uh, or I've tried things that Jim was was referencing in the book. And now it gives me an opportunity to to kind of re-listen it and, and you know, reapply or or take that in combination with something that's happening in the industry now combine the two and voila magic i like when i picked it up and started reading it i within like a page i put it back down and went and found a highlighter yeah it's really good and i like that he gives formulas he gives he gives really good examples and man it sounds like a commercial for the book but we're not getting paid or anything by the way to reference that's it, it. It's just that's, really the, good. that's the episode right there <laughs> it's just, it's just really really good anyways um, you know what? Let, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors, man. We're we're three episodes in, and I haven't talked about Four Eyes, the amazing company. Um, I really like Four Eyes, and it's not because they're sponsoring the show, by the way. Um, I, I hate like doing these because I don't want to sound like a commercial, but I really, really like their their platform. Um, so I want to make sure to 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 give them a shout out. I, you know what I like about Four Eyes is I like that they're uh, we're in an alternative base. Um, market right now, uh, like mm-hmm. uh, customers just don't get they they are not finding what they're looking for, and so they're they're settling or they're you know they're kind of switching their um their their first choice. And I think Forize does a fantastic job of reengaging with those customers and not just sending information about cars that they've that customers have digitally shown interest in, but it sends them alternatives. Mm-hmm. Which I think it's a really good thing in the market that we are right now. And they'll also they'll do a they'll do a trial for you for free. 
for like 60 days or something like, I mean, a company that does that really believes their product, right? Because they're like, listen, try it. No questions asked. If it doesn't work, then we're done. Um, you know, we'll shake hands and we'll be friends. But, um, you know, I can't think of a single company that I've put on there that didn't do it. Well, there's one store in the group that, that I'm working in right now that, that didn't, you know, it's a Mercedes Benz store. It's just a different setup. But, um, for the most part, everybody that I've ever recommended to, they, they, they have always picked it up. So I don't know. What do you think, Cherry? Do you use it? I like it. I've Pretty been good, using right? four eyes for ever. For a minute. Yeah. Right. So. And then we went off of it for a little while and then we went back on. I like it. It's just kind of like, it does its thing in the background and, and they're really, that's the other thing. I mean, we, we talked about this last week, the vendor partners, we, they're really good at, at being there when you need them. You can call them at any point and they'll answer really, really attentive. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to Adam and Zach. Zach's our, our rep and Adam is the, is the salesperson. They're always like there for us. Whenever we call, they always um, you know, they always reach out. So shout out to them. And then I just was on a call with, with, uh, the founder, David Steinberg last week. And that dude's amazing, super knowledgeable, super helpful. Um, I just like companies like that, dude, that I like to partner up with companies that I feel care about your success. And they're like, dude, whatever we need to do to help you win more. Yeah. And that's definitely a litmus for me when I'm working with somebody is whether or not they're accessible. And if, my, um, my vendor rep is inaccessible. I probably won't fight for you during the budgeting meetings. Not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, for sure. That's the way it should. That's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, so we got a link in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to the dis video description, click on the link, sign up for their, for their demo or their trial, actually 60 days, I think it is, or 30 days, absolutely free. No questions asked, guys. You got nothing to lose. Might as well give it a shot. Or if you're listening to this, wherever you get your podcast fix, go to the show notes and mm -hmm. go to sign up for their free trial. It's awesome. You won't regret it. I promise you. Anyway, let's move on. So I'm super, super excited. It's going to be a great episode. We're going to have Jim here on in a moment. But let's check in. Let's check in. Let's check let's check in. in. Yeah. There's my, my Venezuelan coming out. Let's check in with what's going on in the automotive industry today. Yeah, but now I want to know why that's your Venezuelan chicken. Because Checking of in. the accent. It was like that chicken. Chicken. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I would like to start this this session of the automotive news with a quote from season seven, episode one. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, we're already quoting episode one. Mm -hmm. It's been a good episode. Hint, hint, if you haven't checked it out, go listen to it. It's pretty amazing. Um, Herb Anderson, EVs won't be a solution, whether it's good for the environment or not, that customer is still going to want to have the feel like they are in the vehicle with the engine and the noise. Okay, geez, now you're, you're, now you're picking on me. Okay. <laughs> I remember when we started this, there was this comment that you said that was like, what was it? Oh yeah, trip me up. That was, that yeah. was. Okay. That Let's was roll. game, game. Let's so do you yeah. know what just happened with Dodge? They just released a concept. Yeah, they 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 did. They're doing a concept with the, with that's going to have the noise. I okay. Here are my thoughts on that. Okay, okay. Like it's not. They're gonna. What? It's got to be like like just the sound. It's not going to be the the sound. You know, the thing about the, about a about a muscle car. It's the sound and the vibration and the imperfection in the machine that makes it awesome. So if they just and make the noise, but it doesn't the have the, shifting. you know, and you don't feel the vibration in the steering wheel and the shaky, that, then it's not going to be, it's just not So the CEO the of Dodge said that they are planning to redefine the American muscle car. It's slated to replace the Charger and Challenger. And 
the article, which was CNBC, says often um, EVs often lack the drive dynamics that many performance car owners enjoy, a problem that auto executives have privately been attempting to solve. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything because it's too soon to tell. But again, <laughs> noise is not enough. Right. So you have but again, if you, they, because electric vehicles don't, apparently, you don't shift them. You don't shift yours at all? No. So they, they have an alternative for that too, um, so that you can shift in the electric. Okay. Well, what are they called? I'm going to say it right now. Let it go on record. Right now, 2022, whatever today is, August 19th. Oh, dude, we're three days away from our from our third, three, our fourth year anniversary. Woo, woo. Um, th that's not going to be an alternative. A person, a muscle car guy uh, or gal that likes the power and the feel of the engine, the combustion, the imperfection of the machine, they're not going to get that from an EV. I'm sorry. They're just not, even if it has the noise. We need to get somebody on the episode that is like a muscle car aficionado. And we're going to have yeah. this conversation. I mean, but but still, they're not going to know because they don't have the experience, right? The car needs to be built, the, the alternative that they're building, and then that person needs to get in it and drive it and then say, oh, yeah, this feels exactly like a nice vehicle. When If that happens, then okay, then, uh, you know, I'll eat my words. But until that day, <laughs> um, I stand by it. I also have a list of vehicles that – the a list of automotive – plans for electrification based on brand if i was i was deciding okay. whether or not i wanted to just dig in but i'll move let's, on let's just say let's i i think we've been talking about evs for three episodes in a row <laughs> right i think we're done with it yes TV, yeah. it's coming <laughs> something's gonna happen with okay that. well that's another one okay it's not evs oh yes okay do Bring you know on. what the how many people backed out of mortgage contracts this in the month of July? Ooh, that's a good one. Like, is it percentage or is it an actual number? I have both. Let me do percentages because a number is too, is it national? Is that a do national? Do year over year. Statistic? Mm -hmm. National? Year statistic? over year. What's the difference between 2021 and 2022? Okay, but is it any national statistic or yes. is it local? Okay, so national. across the United States. NBC. How many, what's the percentage of, of people that backed up? I'm going to say it's 40%. Year over year, 40% is really high. Year over year, we are down, or we are up, sorry, up 12% of people. So, 12% more people backed out of mortgage contracts this year than last year. Oh, dude, I thought that number would be significantly higher. That's no. nothing. That's significant. It was like, I mean, it's not a 63,000. But the reason that I brought that up is that's just, that's just built homes. For um, homes that are being built, 17% of the contracts fell through in July, which is 7% year over year. Right. But the reason why I thought I would have thought that number to be higher is because the interest rate hikes, you know what I mean? And well, the reason that I bring it up is because how much money do you think that the average mortgage contract you lose if you back out of the contract? I don't know. That's 10 grand. At least, right? Depending. How much is the average deposit on a new vehicle that's in the pipeline? Thousand bucks. So we were talking about this in our morning meeting. Why do we think that people are actually going to follow through with like, we have this idea that if we take a deposit from them, that's it. They're ours. They're going to buy the vehicle. We don't have to keep in contact with them. We don't have to. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not the right way to look at it. 
I run into this all the time where people say, well, they put a deposit down, so I'm going to mark it lost in the system. Don't mark it lost in the system. Yeah, or you talk to, or this is that's a good one, or you're talking to a customer and they're like, no, I already put a deposit somewhere else. And you're like, oh, okay, well, you know, they're done. Bye. Yeah. yeah. I'm the perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. I'm the perfect example. I, I had a deposit in one of the stores that I work with, got a car that had only like 300 miles, which is the exact car that I wanted. And they called me up and I, I gladly, you know, lost my deposit and went and picked up the car because I was going to have to wait six or eight months to get it. Mm -hmm. So if people like, are going to back out of their mortgage contracts. And there was, I bought a house one time I, and I almost backed out. I was selling it and I almost backed out this close one day. And I said, like the legal ramifications of backing out of something like that. And they're willing to do that. And you think that they, they're going to stick around for your deposit. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. So the moral here is if you have somebody on a deposit, don't rest on your laurels and think that that's a done deal. And on the flip side, if you're dealing with a customer that's trying to back out or not back out of the deal or anything, but if they're like, Hey, no, I mean, I'm good. I, I already put a deposit somewhere else. Don't think that that customer is done for because you may still have a shot. You never know. I mean, seriously, all they have to do is wait and then they'll realize that they're going to be waiting forever. <laughs> yeah. So cool. those were my two pieces of news. I was a little bit light on the news because I really wanted okay. to dig in with the charger one. No worries. No worries. But yeah, I mean, I think we should put a rule that between now and at least episode 11. We're I'm not, not allowed to talk about EVs anymore. We're not talking about EVs anymore. Like, no, it's not that I don't want to talk about it. I mean, I get it. Like, it's it's a thing. And we got to be we got to be on it. But like, no, nah, like, that was the last so, one. There's there's just not enough information out there for all these claims. It quite frankly, it kind of it kind of seems a little bit absurd to me that some of these predictions and stuff. We'll see again. We'll see, but there's just some other variables other than just saying like we're gonna go 100 electric by 2030. No, man. Like, um, oh right. So now I'm pulling my list out. They said some of these people, some of these things, the milestones are so ridiculously vague. Um, a plug-in hybrid focus. Um. 76% emissions reduction. Yeah, I mean, again, we'll see. But we're not talking about EVs between now and episode 11 at least. I Whatever, promise we'll you talk about them again. I won't so. do any more research for the automotive news section on EVs. I'll look at something else. Right on. Somebody we're go over on. questions on the website. Tell me what else to research. There you go. There you go. You Go to the website. By the way, you can submit your questions now. We just added that portion to our website. Go to dealertalk.io. Go to the podcast tab and go to submit your questions or podcast questions. Click it. Send us your questions. We'll gladly bring them up on the show. Or if it's if it's a, a topic that's uh, broad enough, we will talk about it in one of our blog posts. Or you can go to our YouTube page and you can submit your question on the on a, one of our videos and we mm -hmm. will um, definitely use that as well. So the blog post for this week, we are talking about the lottery winner effect. This is one of my favorites because I came up with this topic myself and I'm really kind of excited about it. Um, Good do you want to talk about it? Yeah. I mean, look, the premise is simple. It's like, um, when you up, when you get something or you get to a certain place and you haven't had the experience required to earn it, meaning you haven't had the experience, the failures, the successes, the trial and error to develop the skills necessary to have that thing or that position or whatever, then you're going to be more likely to fail because you just haven't gotten there in the right, you know, in the, in the, the natural way. 
And I think that there's a lot of that going on in the automotive industry right now, in particular on the sales side, because there's a lot of folks that came in, you know, um, to the space, um, you know, car guys and car Very gals mm -hmm. that just um, came into this weird place that we were in where we weren't really selling as much as we were taking orders mm -hmm. and, you know, making a lot and of not money. Just doing that. So. Because I feel like you've got two different aspects going on. One, you've got the people who were in the automotive industry and then they got the windfall, right? Maybe they were a year in and then COVID hit and all of a sudden they're making hand over fist what they were making before. And then you've got the people who came in during and they're like, they don't know any difference. But both of those scenarios are windfall scenarios where they haven't really earned it through the hard sweat tears kind of earning it that you find in what the Ollie Reed does where you really earned it and you know how to hold on to it. And that just doesn't serve itself for long-term success for our sales teams. And if our sales teams aren't served for long-term success, then who else? Right, but that's that's exactly what I was saying. Like, yeah, they haven't gotten to that place where they've had that, that where they've developed those skills. And now what's going to happen is the rug's going to get pulled under them and they're going to be like, oh, my gosh, like I what? Like, it's not mm -hmm. like this all the time. Like, you mean I'm not going to be making, you know, X amount of commission per car? Like, it's going to you know what I'm saying? And yeah. that's going to be hard. It's going to be, a, it's, you know, a lot of people are going to get punched in the mouth. Right. And they're going to they're not going to be expecting that that reality now for the folks that were here pre-covid it might it's going to be a little bit of a lighter transition but it's still going to be hard because they've gotten mm. used to the pay scale and the pay level and you know pay that but they haven't they they haven't necessarily um accompanied that with volume or increases in what they were doing prior to the situation and so but now they're used to their their lifestyle is different here's the other thing too like I've had, I'm having these conversations now more than ever, but dude, this, this thing didn't just happen two weeks and everybody was like back to normal, dude. Like we're still in it. We're still feeling the impacts of it. It's still not, I still don't feel comfortable saying post anything because right. there's still, there's still a lot of that, of that, um, oh, weirdness yeah. in, in the air sort of a deal. Oh, so, if you're still Googling, should I wear a mask? We're not done. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, it's just, and the behaviors that happened during that time, two years is enough of, of to ingrain, you know, different behaviors. Uh, so we have to really be looking at it. Like if I was an owner operator, I'd be a little bit concerned. I'd be concerned with the talent, the, the, the talent level at my stores. I'd be concerned if I wasn't doing training and development during the during the, this time that that's going to start to impact me. I'd be concerned of extra, you know, massive amounts of turnover. I'm not trying to be the doom and gloom guy, but we got to look at our business from all these different angles. And I really feel like some people, some store, some owner operators are going to feel some, some different pressures because of the situation. Well, and then we get in the, we get in the habits, the bad habits. And since a lot of these people don't know that they're bad habits, they just think that that's the way it is. I've got an agent that today said, <clears throat> I need to know if this vehicle is available so I can call the customer and tell them to come in. I said, has it been built? No. Then it doesn't exist. Get them in on something else or at least tell them, listen, Mr. Customer, this vehicle doesn't exist. We can go over scenarios for what might happen if you want it to exist in your name. But right now it doesn't exist at all. So why are we worrying about it? Focus on what exists in front of you. Right here, yeah. all of these used vehicles, they actually matter. Right. Everything they're else they're is hypotheticals down the road. Exactly. Don't you think that that's, some, that's one of the, th the first things that we're noticing is that there's a lot of folks right now that are very quick. And I'm talking about salespeople that are very quick to say, oh, yeah, that's, you know, we don't have that. All the time. And, and they're not having a broader, wider conversation about the alternatives and what is available. Um, we're just very mm -hmm. quick to say, no, I, well, no, we don't have that. Or we're not right. going to get anymore. Or I've heard people say, 
you know, good luck finding that. Like, oh my gosh, like that's just like really, that's what you're <laughs> gonna tell your customer. The customer that's in front of your face right now, mm -hmm. right? That costs you hundreds of dollars pro probably to get them through the door. That's what you're gonna say to them. Good luck finding that. Like, come mm -hmm. on. My favorite story from last week. A customer has been talking to one of the sales agents and roundabout ends up on the phone with me. And she's like, well, I really, really, really want a hybrid. And I'm like, well, why do you want a hybrid? Because I live here and I have to go five hours over there and I have to do it once a month. I'm like, has anybody asked you this question before? No. Okay. So we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> Because the mileage different on the difference on the vehicle she was looking at for a hybrid highway and hybrid gas, or I mean, highway, gas, highway, hybrid, that was hard to say, was four miles a gallon, four miles a gallon. And nobody had thought to ask her that at all. She would have to wait six to nine months for the hybrid. And I had a gasser on my lot. Did she buy it? Yeah. You oh. Won't. oh, damn well she bought. Six you days. Ask days. me if she bought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, yeah, we gotta get, we gotta. That, that, that's that's what this blog post is all about. We are linking it in the show notes too. So if you're again, if you're watching this on YouTube, go to the video description uh, portion, or if you're listening to this on any of your or wherever, excuse me, you get your podcasts. Uh, fix, then go to the show notes and please read the article, um, ask questions, let us know what you think. Um, love to get your guys' feedback. Anyways, it is that time, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce our guest for this week, the amazing the talented, the one, the only, Mr. Jim Flint. Well, oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Hi. We're super, super excited to have you. Um, I, I expect this to be a really good conversation. So let's just get into it. Uh, we kick things off here uh, with, a, uh, with an intro. So tell us about you. I am Jim Flint, president and founder of Local Search Group Digital Marketing. I started the company about 12 years ago now. So when there was that economic recession in 08, 09, it was the automotive depression. And what a great place to start a company from because there was only upside from there. Here First we are point. 12 years later. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, so I, I'm super geeked out for this one because I've, uh, I've read your book and I think it's amazing. Um, at the time when I first picked up that book, and I think I mentioned this to you in a, in a one on one conversation that we had, um, I was an auto trader rep. And so, of course, I'm going, I'm looking at the stuff, being like, mm, I don't know, man, you know, like, and then the more I, I, I got seasoned and experienced and stuff, the more sense it made. And I always remember going back to the book and being like, oh, that's what he was talking about here. Or that's what he was referencing here. So, um, yeah, just, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, man? Like what got you in that, in that mindset or in that groove of, Hey, I'm going to write this book and put this information out there. You know, it was, it was one of those things where all these unique experiences that I had had came together to put me in the right place at the right time. It didn't always feel like that, but if you remember, there was a movie, I think it won the Academy Award for best picture Slumdog Millionaire. Yes. And so the way the book sets up, it's called car dog millionaire. Right. Each chapter, there's a question like a trivia question at the beginning of it, where if you're able to answer it after reading the chapter, it's like, OK, now it makes sense. So I, I'm so excited to hear that you had the experience that maybe in the moment it didn't make sense, but that ultimately it did. It's not intended to be confusing, but as you go through life, there's all these things that are happening, happening around us. Right. And they're really setting us up for future success, depending right. on how we see it. And, and that was part of what it was too. like in the collective, you know, there's the old school car dogs who choose to do things the old way, right? Because it's comfortable and it's convenient. But at that point, the Internet was inevitable. And so as people continue to evolve, it was like, hey, look, 
you get to make a choice too. Mm-hmm. Not not all things are going to happen to you. You can make things happen. And so I, I feel like in an indirect way, the book is very empowering. Yeah, for sure. So so again, I, I mean, at that time, I had just gone out of uh, training with Cox Automotive, which I was a you know, fresh rep for Auto Trader, and the whole thing that they ingrained during that process is BDPs, 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 right? We don't deliver leads, we deliver views. Right. And so what, what, one of the first things that clicked for me at that point was I remember going in, you know, fresh out in the field and, and you know, asking the question that you that you kind of reference in the book. I, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something to the effect of like most marketing managers don't know the relationship between website visits and sales. Like if you were to ask them, hey, how many how many cars did you sell last month in relationship to how many people were on your website? They have no clue. And I was like, okay, I'm going to put this to the test, right? And so I, w- I was having these conversations and I would ask them and sure enough, man, like it was like, I don't know. So, <laughs> you know, slowly I started to use some of the stuff in there and I was like, oh my God, this is so true. Like they have no idea. It's crazy. So. Yeah. Part of my goal was to take some of the wish out of marketing mm-hmm. because, because, and part and parcel to that is the dealer operators coming out of 08, 09 were very focused on profitability because that was exactly what was being challenged. So you didn't just come up with a great idea anymore. It was kind of like you had to have the idea plus the analytics, plus you had to continue to prove it month after month. And so the discipline set in real quick. Oh yeah. So, so here's the thing. So I have a very, I don't know. I've had conversations with other, um, you know, agencies and and vendors and, and, you know, whenever I, I talk about my marketing philosophy, they're always like, oh, I don't know. Like there's, there seems to be a lot of elements missing there. But I have a very basic four pillar marketing philosophy that seems to work and it's based on traffic, right? It's like what drives the most traffic to your site, double down on those efforts, provided that it's like in market shoppers, right? People that are right. that are in market to buy a car and you're going to sell more cars. I mean, yes. unless your website is crappy and your your, your digital experience is, is, is totally off. But so it's comprised of SEO, SEM display or social or display or video like YouTube, when I say display, not so much display on, you know, retargeting or whatever and social media. I think if you do those four things really, really well, and you can drive consistent traffic to your site, you're going to sell more cars. People go to your website as a land of no competition. Um, If you have the right traps and stuff, it makes it stickier. You get people to stay in your sandbox, all those things. Do you think that that's, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's, do you think, you know, it, are there some elements missing and what would that be? I No, I think you're on target. I think what happens is we went from this process where we went after leads so hot and heavy, and then we just chased those customers so hard that they decided, you know, the last thing I'm going to do a second time, because you taught me that if I touch the stove, it's really, really hot. Mm-hmm. I'm not submitting a lead anymore because that means I'm going to get like 5,000 phone calls. You won't leave me alone and you're going to send me emails. And it's, it's just a very frustrating experience. So they stop doing leads. And what you're finding out is, like you're saying, that when people come to your website, if you built a better mousetrap and you made it a stickier experience, that's actually leads, right? And and the crazy thing about it, a long time ago, I don't know if it was 20 years ago, but we'll say before the internet, they, the purchase funnel was where it was all at. And so you had awareness and consideration, intention, shopping and buying. Well, what happened with the internet, all those things collapsed into one. Like you could do all that online at the same time. And so as you build out your funnel, which is kind of what you described with your your four steps, as long as its intent is to help a dealership sell cars and make money, then I think you're down the, the right path directionally. The nuances become really important with the ability to serve up pixels on Google and Facebook, for example, for remarketing purposes, or like on social media, I see so many clients, not mine, but others that say, you know, <laughs> I want, I want people to go from my Facebook page, you know what I mean? From the dealership website to my Facebook page when it's, that's exactly wrong. You want people to come from your Facebook page to your dealership website. And right. as such, you do not need to put your social media logos in the header of your dealership web page. You need to put it in the footer, right? Because right. in the header, you're you're giving them an excuse to go off and do so many other things. Yeah. yeah. And so it's 
it's it is a mousetrap. And so if you don't have a game plan, then you're going to end up in a bad place. For sure. Yeah. Charity, what are your thoughts on the on, on the on the lead aspect of it? You're a BDC manager, right? So that's important to your to your to how you, you know, it's important. Well, I was just thinking about the 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 social media links in when I first started doing all of this. I remember I would write the blog posts for the dealership I was at and I would always link because writing like you're supposed to attribute everything to where you get it from. So I would always link things like auto trader to the blog posts. And then blindly my dealership would post them like that with all of these links to places other than our dealership. And now I look back at that and I'm like, oof, <laughs> I should have been thinking so differently than <laughs> In, in, in 2022, do you still, are leads still a very important part of your day to day? Or could you run the BDC and be like, hey, we're not focused on leads. We're going to do more outbound, not so much whatever leads. No, we do more grade. outbound. But my BDC runs a little bit differently than the traditional sense. So we focus a good majority of my energy on outbound. Um, we take all of the phone ups for the dealership. And um, we do the, what I call unsolds. So anything, any customers that have come into the building and left the building, that is my area. But equity mining, outbound campaigns, there is so much to do that mm -hmm. it is just on a daily basis. I don't even know where to start. I've got, you know, five agents making 200 calls and 50,000 names, you know, it's just, it's unreal, overwhelming. And before when I was an agent, outbound, outbound doesn't pay the way that you, it, it does, it's not as lucrative. So everybody avoids doing it. And that's where all the money is in my opinion. Yeah, but see, I, that's where I get I get so confused with that. And, and the BDC gurus out there are going to hate me for saying this, but I don't look at inbound as, first of all, I, I don't think we should be wasting as much time on leads as we do, right? According to Google, only 29% of people are actually going to submit a traditional form. The mm -hmm. majority of customers just show up to the dealership. So I think when we focus on leads, we're focusing on the lowest amount of potential customers that we can get. So that to me seems a waste. And then we spend all this money on marketing that generates all this activity, like this inbound activity. And then we have an agency or a department rather within the dealership that gets paid for something that's going to happen anyway. See, don't but... get that. Now I know that, well, they're, they're, just because they call doesn't mean that they're going to set up an appointment, but dude, they call, that means they're doing 14 plus hours of research. That means they've already chosen you. Right. You just have to screw that that up. Yeah, they might have questions and stuff like that. I get it. But still, I don't know. I mean, wh what are your thoughts? I mean. I don't disagree with that. We spend a lot of money and then we push them and we drive them to a phone call. And if you're not catching that phone call, well, um, you just screwed up a lot of money for your company. Most dealerships aren't handling that phone call. Well, I. I know I've said but this not before. Just that. Do you think that you should get that, not you per se, but the BDC department should get paid on an inbound? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, I mean, you think that they shouldn't be paid on inbound or they shouldn't? No, be I think that the BDC business development should be developing business. Well, I mean, I know what you're coming in. Where's the development part? I don't get it. Okay. I know where you're going with this because we've had this discussion before, right? Um, Herb is of the mind that um, business development should focus on developing business, meaning an out, outbound campaigns. Creating, I don't know, Jim, what are your thoughts? Like creating business that wasn't there to begin with, right? You're developing it. You're getting business to the dealership that otherwise without you wouldn't exist. So I'll, I'll put the premise on this. Pay plans matter. And it... <laughs> All you have to do is know that fundamentally walking in and then anybody on the management team at a dealership 
right? Even desk manager up, go listen to the calls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the issue. That's where it all comes together because then you realize, oh, I mean, seemingly, yes, it's an inbound call. And all we have to do is say hello and be pleasant. That, that in and of itself is not necessarily foundational. (laughs) So especially in a place where we are, you know, being in the right place, the right times are really critical. We look at service levels are down, not just in automotive, but across multiple industries. Industry, yeah. Yeah. And so it's very difficult to find the right people. And so if we don't, if if we set them in a room and say, hey, just take the call, they're not going to try to get appointments and they're not going to care about shows and they may not care if the deal got sold. But you want to at least have them to have the proper mo- motivation so they're aligned with the organization. And listening to the calls is part of that. That's the pay plan's not the only thing, but knowing that somebody's going to inspect what they expect. If if I know my manager's never going to listen to my calls, mm-hmm. I'm going to do what I want, how I want. Now more than ever, businesses need more efficient sales. That's why thousands of dealerships trust Four Eyes to help with things like automated inventory email updates and ensuring all of your leads get into the CRM. To try Four Eyes for free, visit foureyes.io slash dealer talk. That's foureyes.io slash dealer talk. Well, and I think that it goes deeper than just you putting them in a room and saying, okay, make some phone calls. We live, uh, I've talked about this before. We, this generation coming in, they don't know how to make phone calls. They don't know how to talk on the phone. My kids <laughs> didn't have a phone when they were children. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so much more basic. Oh God, than that's that. a good point. I never thought about it, but like, they don't, they don't do it like at home and stuff like not at all. There's no mm-hmm. training that's on the good. phone. That's and so good. as a business development manager or a, a, floor manager, it becomes our prerogative to start by teaching them how to talk on the phone. And that's, it blows my mind. It, it, that becomes a skill set that everybody needs to have. And if you secret shop even a little bit, you will find that it is abysmally bad out there. And and you know what you're setting up there is like the generational gap is huge because the person Mm -hmm. I think more than likely that would call would be baby boomer, right? right? Possibly Gen X who they do have somewhat those skills. And if they're going to make a big ticket purchase, which is call a car, one of those things, their expectations are up here. And then the performance Mm -hmm. to your point without training and or experience is way down there. You, um, in your book, you were talking about the video games that everybody played that like, that's what it makes me think of every time is, oh, it's not just like learning how, okay, we go back to what is business development in my mind and the way that I explain it to my mom. Yeah. (laughs) Marketing creates the message and sales sells the message and business development is who gets them through that process. They are the ones at the middleman that takes the message and delivers they the receive person it. to the sales yeah. floor. They're the bridge, yeah. right? That's yeah. like they're the bridge. And there's yeah. so much nuance to that. And they, it gets bypassed all the time. But there's nuances and, and communication skills that go into that that are not fundamentals to human existence. And you have to be consciously aware of those to have the skill sets that you need moving forward. In And I tell my agents all the time, these skills that you're learning, they will take you further than you can possibly imagine. Yeah. If you oh, take yeah. the time to learn them. For sure. You know what, too? I don't know. Did you re- do you remember the video game? What the analogies by generation? Um, Is there- I remember Mario Brothers was mine. <laughs> and Snapchat. <laughs> and yeah, Mario Brothers is Gen um, X. We have patterns that deliver. repeat. Delivering it back to them. Ping pong? Ping pong was baby boomers. And that's part of the phone call conversation, right? Mm -hmm. They they, like they expect you to they say this and then you respond with that. Right. It's it's an exchange. Comes back and forth. Yeah. And that concept right there, I try to teach that on the phones. So I'm like, it's a give and take. If they call and say, Hey, do you have a Bronco? You say, I can check on that. What's your name? Yes. And my 
my agents are like, no, we don't have any Broncos, but thanks for calling. And you're like, stop well, talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and their generation is Angry Birds, if you remember, mm -hmm. which if you played that back in the day, you, mm -hmm. you know, you just shoot the bird and you kind of see what chaotic thing occurs and the outcome is interesting. So yeah, we don't have it. What do you want to, what's next? Right. And mm -hmm. so it's like, oh, mindset really does matter. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, for sure. And generate and uh, nuances of the generational stuff and the communication skills, like you, it's just not taught anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge oh, competitive yeah. advantage if you have it. Yeah. Right? That oh my god, yeah. Imagine calling five dealerships and having the one that's completely di a different experience positively. And you're like, oh yes, it's so refreshing. And you're like, yeah. Hey, like that call you had, where was it in Dallas or something? Dallas. Uh, so I um, learned a long time ago that one of the best training tools is to secret shop dealerships. Yeah. So you talk about what you're not supposed to say on the phone and what you're supposed to say on the phone and then you call people. And I ran into this dealership in Dallas that was, I was floored. Like I wanted to buy a car. I oh, was, in terms of they were that good. They, they were, were that so good. good. Yeah. I mean, all yeah. of them are just, usually it's, it's pretty bad. Most of the time, nobody asks for my name. I, and when I call, it's not like I call and say, Hey, I'm looking for, uh, insert most specific hybrid vehicle you could possibly come up with. I say, so I don't really know a lot about your vehicle, but I'm kind of looking for something that maybe, so I'm vague. Okay. Yeah. And they're like, no, we don't have any hybrids. Thanks. Bye. And you're like, <laughs> oh, it makes me crazy. But I ran into this dealership down in Dallas that by the time I was done with the first phone call, they had offered me a steak dinner. They had offered me a TV and a flight to Dallas to take a look at the vehicles. I hung up the phone and within five minutes, I had five images in my phone of vehicles. Like I felt bad. So bad. Yeah. <laughs> this guy went to work for me and that's, that's awesome. what we need yeah. because that doesn't happen. And if I'm calling five different dealerships, like I still remember the guy's name. I remember the dealership, everything. If I'm calling five, 10 different dealerships and everybody is right now and everybody says, no, I don't have that. No, I don't have that. No, I don't have that. And then that one guy says, Hey, what's your name? That's the guy you're going to stick with. And yeah, that, sure. that is why you pay them to answer the phone. Yes. But it, 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 it also, um, it's also, it also, it's also, I don't want to say good because for the industry it's bad, but, um, it's not that hard to differentiate yourself still in 2020. Right, which is like so if you sad. do something just a little bit different, it's very easy for you to differentiate yourself, um, which could be, well, is an advantage to the, for those dealerships that want to take it, they want to, you know, utilize so, it. So Herb, let me ask you this way. When you look at like personal productivity, personnel, right? As a percentage of the total, a lot of the best operators try to keep, you know, 60, 70% of it on sales side, right? So that they're focused on selling and variable revenue. So would you take the BDC department in your perfect world and say they are a cost center or a profit center? I mean, that's just one way to think about it. I don't know the I, right answer. I'm just curious. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's why that's why I pose that 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 question, which I know like all the BDC gurus out there are gonna be like, this guy's crazy. Yeah, I but I I'll wouldn't, guru, if it were me, if it were me, right what's your answer, Herb? Well, it's, a, <laughs> it's a profit center, but if you, if you can't really set it up, <laughs> if, it, if you set it up the traditional way where they're taking everything, that's not a BDC, that is a call center. If you're doing everything, if you're taking inbound and outbound and you're taking all the phone calls and you're doing, you are a call center. A BDC is hunting, they're hunters, they're developing business. And you don't develop business from stuff that's coming in that you've already paid money to get that message out there to market, to get in front of the right customer. But and that goes back that to, in. unless you have your sales team taught how to deliver that marketing message, then you have to have a team taught to deliver that marketing message. 
Otherwise, you were literally creating a message that nobody is following through with. And I'm when okay with at that. the dealership level. My issue is that we call it a business development center, and it's just not accurate. When, when they're functioning as operators, right? right? It, that's what you're yeah. saying. I get that. Yeah, that makes sense. That, they they then, should do both, in my mind. Mm -hmm. Like, but then let's call it let's call it what it is, because that way we can set up the right metrics, and the, let's call it a call center. And then we can, with us, with a flavor of BDC, because you have maybe one or two agents in there that all they do is outbound. That's a little bit more of the reality that I see out there in most dealerships. Okay, so I'm reminded of a years ago, like 15 years ago, the federal government decided to change the food stamp program its name from the food stamp program to SNAP, which is sustainable nutrition, something, something, because they wanted the word nutrition in the program name, because if the word nutrition was there, then people would eat better. I just, I call BS on that kind of stuff. Call it what you want, but what you need is the structure. And if you want to structure a business development center to be in the within a standard operating procedure of this is you have this section and you have this section and you have this section, then that's the basic framework for a business development center. But changing the name of something doesn't change anything. You have to change the entire structure, the entire framework, the thought process behind it, not just the name of it. Like Jim, you have, you have a thought? Yeah, back to the idea that pay plans matter, maybe a way to kind of like get there. It's just you know, put this out here, you guys do what you will with it, but <laughs> spend the first 30, 60 days with somebody where you're an operator and you get a base salary, right? That's mm. it. It's a flat, right? And your job is to take inbounds. And if you earn the right by doing excellent work there, you now get to move on to phase two of your career path here at the dealership. And that's where you get to make the outbound calls. And that's where the variable comp comes in. And that's where we measure appointments and shows right. and your percentage gets you a bonus. Right, so that we elevate their commitment to the organization, so so that more variable income is driven by their efforts. Just mm -hmm. a thought. Yeah. Yeah. So this goes to yeah I, I'm okay with something like that. By the way, did you just call bullshit on my statement that I? Just I did. Made? Call bullshit on your statement. Up, <laughs> no, because here's the thing: because we call it a BDC, right? And then we have all this activity that's not, in my opinion, again, I, I don't run BDC department, so maybe I'm just completely not, this is a statement of true ignorance, but because we call it that way and we're grouping everything in there, then what happens at the end of the month when you go and you look at the sales and it's like, oh, I sold, you know, let's just simple math, hundred cars and the BDC is like, oh, we sold 70. What? Like, really? You developed 70 car deals? Like, come on, like that's not, that's not in line with the, now, if you're a call center, then fine. You can do 90 of those hundred because the, it's a, you know, this is the internet era, right? Like anything, everything that's going to happen is going to come in some way, shape or form digitally. That's going to funnel into the deal. I mean, it's all semantics at that point. Did right. they do work that led to the customer yeah. walking into the building for a committed appointment and that customer sold? Yes or no? Should they get paid for that work? Yes or no? Yes. It's just course. it's just semantics at that point. Like no, because if it's a <laughs> business and you actually generate true new business, true new business, then you should get rewarded significantly more than if you're just oh oh you saw us on Auto Trader, great. You know I'll set an appointment for you. Boom boom. boom. Yeah, you're gonna be here Wednesday at two. Great, awesome. Can you tell that Herman and I have already done this before? Can, can I? Can you? You've had this conversation. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I said, I said, I don't know. I, was, I, I thought this was going to be more about analytics. Is this all of a sudden we're talking about BDC? Like, where's where coming? I do have about? a question, Jim, though. In sure. your book, one of the things that you talk about is conversion rates. So, as long as I've been doing this, it's been 60, 60, 60. And those were not the numbers in your book. So, I'm curious. 60% Ooh, of your okay. contacts should set, 60% oh, okay. should show, 60% should sell. I almost said sold, yeah. should sell. 
And those I think I was, that you gave. I think I went 75, 25, 50 or something like that. You did 25, 25, 75, 25. There you go. Um, why? I, I would tell you, well, I'm just going to bring it to present day real quick because mm -hmm. we're in the fourth dimension on mm -hmm. what appointments and shows and, and the fourth dimension really is availability of the product. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the game is completely changed. Sure. I mean, I've, I've continued to zoom out a little bit because back then things were so normal in terms of monetary policy, right? After the recession, things were pretty steady state for 10 years in terms of interest rates and things like that. And so there was some consistency, there was competition, there was personnel, right? That those costs were pretty relatively the same. The day supply was pretty relatively the same. Your used car inventory had a kind of a common flow to it, you know, the 60 day turn, those kind of mm -hmm. things. And so all those metrics meant something in that window of time. But at the point that the Fed started printing money the way that they do are, you know, it's off now. So things are going to change a little bit. But for the last, let's call it post pandemic experience, that has happened. So more money's been available subsequently too. ironically with chips and supply shortages, inventory isn't as available. So the profit per unit's gone way up and uh -huh. the need for as much personnel, the need for as much inventory and the need for as much advertising has been significantly reduced. So if the name of the game is selling cars and making money, today's environment involves, I need the inventory. That's probably your greatest predictor of success, which was different than it was back then. Right. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Gosh, that's only two years ago, right? I mean, back then. No, but it, it, back it, it then. Seemed, what, was I, I just, what was that quote I heard? I heard a quote the other day that said, um, sometimes, Nothing happens in dec for decades, and other times, decades happen in weeks. And I feel like the last couple of years have been like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's a good segue to one thing I wanted to, I wanted to pick your brain on. Sure. Um, in today's environment, like like if you were you know you went to see a dealership today, and right. you're talking they're you're talking to them about hey this is the plan this is the strategy. Um, just from a digital standpoint, what would be your, your, your main, you know, what would be kind of like the way that you would set that up in this, in this environment that we are right now? I would start with used cars. Mm -hmm. Would you say yeah. that, that make sure that that's the, obviously that's gotta be the focus on everything, search, social, like just go all in on that and then buy a lot, or do you still gotta be a little bit cautious of that? I, well, you need to turn more quickly now, mm -hmm. right? And the thing you want to monitor is availability of new car inventory. I mean, I think Jack Hollis from Toyota came out yesterday and said they looked for next year to be when inventory levels were back to the right um, space and place that they wanted to be. And I, I also know that the EV component, like there's a lot of conversation, but there's not a lot of product in terms of, so there's, there's as you said earlier, there's this, you know, the words, right. But then the reality, and I think the analytics bring the reality. So mm -hmm. like, if you really want to know how things are going, look at the day supply on Silverado trucks, or what is it? That's the bottleneck. Is it the engines right for the Silverado? Yes. Okay. So now I need to kind of keep up with what it is with the product that is preventing the availability. Is it the chips? If it's the chips, right? So it's, that was the thing about the Bermuda Triangle. We were finding the bottleneck and identifying it preemptively. Now the preemption is, and the bottleneck is product. And so the whole used car thing doesn't tip until, in other words, prices come crashing down until there's better availability of new car inventory. And to be candid, it doesn't seem like the manufacturers are mm -hmm. that bothered by it. I know the retailers don't mind um, higher gross profit per unit. The consumers have had the cash available to make the payments, right? And to step up to make the purchase. But at some point, we have pulled a lot of purchases forward. And when that 
moment comes. I don't know when it will. Typically, it happened every year when the new model year got introduced, right? And the mm -hmm. used car prices came down. So now it's like, when's that going to happen? Because to me, that's the tipping point that says we're headed back, or at least we're going on a different journey than the one that we've been on for the last two years. But haven't you started to see that? I've started to see that happening already. I've started to see, I think like mid-June, there was a shift, man. And it just, I see digital activity staying strong still, but the, the conversion of that has kind of, I've slowly kind of coming down. I don't know. I mean, has that been your experience as well? Or I don't think we've reached capitulation yet. Oh, no, 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 by no means. But yeah. there is, there's a little bit of a difference that's starting to be felt. I, you know, I, that's what I'm seeing in the, in, with the stores that I work with. I, I mean this very humbly, but watching the Fed, the interest rate and what they're doing has become a sport unto itself. <laughs> and as they as they increase interest rates or pledge to, but then don't or mm -hmm. become hawkish or dovish, it, it does set us up for what's going to happen in the car business. It, it did more than I ever thought it would. Oh, yeah. But to say that it isn't going to continue to impact that would be. I mean, it's already starting to impact housing, right? With the mortgage rates going up and the interest rates on cars. And so I, it's somewhere between where the Fed keeps pushing higher and somewhere where the availability comes back at the same time, that's when we'll have a capitulation of it mm -hmm. in automotive. Sure. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, we'll feel it first here too. Um, I definitely, from, you know, a customer standpoint and being on the phones, everybody's so angry and, and you you I can feel it in the conversations that I have with customers I had somebody call me an idiot the other day because <laughs> because the dealerships two hours from me had a market adjustment that he didn't like so you know I was gonna say or, what are they mad about what are, yeah or, what are they yeah. or another one he was mad because he wanted a vehicle that I didn't have and my entire pipeline is sold out of them. And he's like, well, when are you getting another one? And I said, I don't, I don't know when I'm getting another one. The OEM hasn't told me. And he goes, well, that's dumb. I'm like, it doesn't change the conversation that you think it's dumb. <laughs> still not going to happen. I'm still not magically going to have that vehicle that you want. I've got used ones, but you don't that, want one of those. That's so the acknowledge. Dumb. <laughs> acknowledge, ignore, move on. Right. But we get <laughs> yeah, right. so, so focused on like, when is it going? When, 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 when are we going to get new ones? When are we going to get new ones that start focusing on what you have in front of you? Because the new ones are not going to magically show up and they're not going to show up for a while. Even if we had, we woke up tomorrow and there was a plethora of new vehicles that, you know, the OEMs said, okay, we're going to give you everything you could possibly dream of, but we still have to build it. So you're still looking at months out. So well, there's, why there's are you not selling what's in front of you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you, Jim, do you, do you think that the, that is, is it still wise from the marketing standpoint to look at um, uh, website traffic as a predictor or as a as a way to anticipate activity or sales or is it a little bit harder to measure in this environment because there's mm -hmm. so much more people out in the market um you know the the i read an article on um i think it was on msnbc that talked about the buying cycle is now like 170 days so yeah their customers you know if that's true then customers would go online to look but they're not necessarily going to per you know pull the trigger like in the next 30 to 60 days. So what are, what are your thoughts there? I, I think, you know, any good uh, general manager, that has got to be one of the critical metrics that you have. I mean, it's right up there with sales because you're getting directional guidance on interest in the products you have. And so, I, I mean, it'd be equivalent to, you know, understanding the temperature outside, right? But not mm -hmm. knowing whether or not it's raining. You kind of want to know both to be better prepared for the experience that you want to have like that. in your operations. Yeah. yeah. Do, so um, it, you, do you think that if we do see a trend of traffic going the, the opposite negative, 
even though there was an there was an influx of traffic for the past two years because people were home and stuff that's still a good predictor of hey you know either our marketing is off or something's happening in the market yeah i do i do think for you know two purposes one there's a buying heuristic right which is still predicted by vehicle display pages at the moment of truth when i'm about to buy a car i'm going to look more often at pictures because i'm getting mm -hmm. closer to that moment closer. of truth yeah and then if i'm overall like hierarchical looking at my website and saying okay i've got a lot of visitors that's shopping behavior and so i want to understand the difference between the two and to the degree that i have good metrics right because otherwise it's garbage in garbage out but to mm -hmm. the degree that the metrics are good if i know that shopping behavior is going on i'm confident that ultimately it will turn into buying behavior mm -hmm. the the inverse is not true so if my shopping and they're not absolutely tied together but you should kind of keep that rule i mean look we keep score you might win a football game by 70 points right but that doesn't count for you know in the nfl columns they've had points for and points against that doesn't really count your record is whether or not you won that game so really right. in the automotive space it's like did i win that month did i Am I mm -hmm. as profitable as I wanted to be? Did I meet my manufacturer's requirements for sales efficiency? Did I gain market share, for example? Whatever those metrics happen to be for you and your organization, you have to set those up and say, am I knocking them down? Because sometimes those shopping characteristics do carry over from month to month, right? We typically know seasonally adjusted, October is going to be really low. And then it's going to pick up in November and December is going to be really big. But as I look at like the thing that, matters a lot is seasonally adjusted annual rate so i can still keep track of that back during that decade of dominant you know there's just that straight plateau it wasn't bad it wasn't good our sar ran pretty much at 17 million mm -hmm. now now we're running south of that with a promise of a future increase but everybody's more profitable and i've got to believe the manufacturers are more profitable because they don't have to guess right they're just it's more of a steady state for them. That mm -hmm. variable element has been reduced as a result of the pandemic and as a result of less availability in the supply chain. So I have gotten more like, it used to be such a huge advantage to know your stats and details on your webpage. Now I need it kind of like zoomed out a little bit and just know directionally, all right, yeah, I've got 12,000 visitors to my website. In a typical month, I get 10 or 15 or 20, whatever my number is, and make it relational to my previous experience. That's a lot. That's a lot there to unpack. I think. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's great, man. They're, 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 I, I love that. It kind of flows into the next thing I wanted to ask you. Um, because of the used car uh, push that we have right now, should we be doing more? Obviously, we want to have a, a combination of strategies, right? Granular, then specific to the cars that we have. But should we be also doing a lot on the on the higher funnel stuff like use car near me very vague you know because typically we've kind of flipped that the past couple of years or pre-covid where we're yeah. like well we don't want to go that high because then we're driving a bunch of customers that are maybe 90 days out or whatever um should we kind of incorporate or put more push towards that because to try to bring those customers in or what are your thoughts there i i think there's two things you can do one of them is sell us your car because right, the, the value right. proposition for a dealership Absolutely. on taking a trade is much stronger than at auction or any other place you could be. So you wanna keep, that needs to happen in perpetuity. Like that's just good business practice. And then, and, and then the second thing, and this may sound crazy, but I've, I've been doing it for a while. So this is one of those life hacks. Check out what Carvana's doing. They're, they're basically a marketing company. Right. And so mm -hmm. they're making these promises to consumers that dealers haven't kept. That's all they're doing. And so if you want to be a better dealer operator on new or used, just pick one thing out of what Carvana is saying that they'll do and make sure that your staff does it. And over the course of a year, because, you know, they may have seven or eight things that they're able to make happen. You are going to be a much stronger operation. There's just no way around it. Now, don't read about how profitable Carvana is. Don't I mean, right? Because they're losing money. They had a really bad quarter. I don't know if they lost a billion or what, but sixty-seven percent down or something like that. So yeah, it, it was a big, huge drop. But in terms of like having the right operational messages, they're pretty much game on. That's good, man. I like that. I like that a lot. I think that um, we had Paul and Kyle Mount Seer. Mount Seer, yes. 
yeah. from Soder here as, a, as our show, as our season opener, and they talked about um, you know um, not mimicking but utilizing playing to the strengths of some of these companies that are coming in because they they make it possible for us for the dealers to obviously learn or piggyback off some off, off of some of the stuff that they're doing to kind of strengthen our own operations. And I think there's, there was, there was a lot of truth there. And it's a very wise um, kind of way to, to look at the business. Cause we, we tend to be like, oh, there are competitors. We hate them. And, mm-hmm. and we, we disregard the, the benefit that, that, that we can gain from studying them as well and learning from them. I, I mean, think about it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I had a conversation with my mom this morning and she was, She's sweetly saying, I don't know how I would talk on a podcast about cars all day. (laughs) But she said, I don't know anything about cars, but I know that Teslas are really expensive and they're really nice. And I was like, whoa, mom, that's like marketing right there. (laughs) So, I mean, then that was that was the thought process of my whole morning was, okay, let's play that thought exercise. I don't know a lot about. Hawaii, but I know that they have great beaches, right? Well, you know, Tesla doesn't do advertising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Famously, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So then that that question becomes, if you're going to look at it, you can literally just ask that question and you're probably- You go buy Twitter. You buy Mm -hmm. Twitter. That's the deal. That's it. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) But they're going to have to (laughs) once, if we get to this 20, 30, goal and we're going to have all these other they don't have to right now because they're they're the only game in town you know you know like what what else is there but eventually right. when all the manufacturers catch up they're going to have to do advertising they will well, you yeah. can totally ask that about your your own dealership what are the people in your town say i don't know a lot about and, that place but i do know and that's why you play <laughs> If you have one thing to Jim's point, if you have one thing that you do really, really, really well, mm-hmm. like really well, you don't need to do a marketing as much because the the that's gonna that's what's gonna carry it, right? That word of mouth, mm-hmm. all those things, that's what's gonna help you get the business. You know what I mean? So, um, what, one of the big ones, I mean, a huge one. I I remember talking about it because I think Carvana had a seven day return policy. Yeah. And I, I was trying to convince a client that they should do a three day on new cars. I mean, come on. Right. He goes, mm-hmm. you're out of your mind. I go, hey, they're doing seven days on used. Would you ever do that? No. Well, a year later, he's doing it. Right. But sometimes it's like having that painful realization that the world is evolving right in front of our very eyes. So rapidly. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, there's there's one thing uh, I wanted to talk to you about here, and look, I, I hate even having these conversations because I don't want I don't want the audience to think that I, that we're we're bashing anybody. That's not the the goal here. But I mean, it is a big part of our marketing mix. And it's when I have people like you on the show, I always like to talk about the endemics and third parties and where do you see them fit it, fitting into the marketing mix of 2022 and beyond. Are there still is there still a place? Do you think that they're that they're dying out? So this isn't a bash session. I'm not, you know, but just, yeah. You know, what are your, what are your thoughts there? I, you know, I think it's probably important to know where I came from on this so that that context gives a better uh, filter to what I'm about to say. But when, and I know you work for Auto Trader, which is great. Yeah. I think it's an incredible company and respect tremendously the, the talent level, the effort, the capabilities and abilities of the people there. But as a business model, what happened with the internet and it was you actually, like I mentioned earlier, had everything available on your website, right? To everyone at any time. So you could literally hit every aspect of the purchase funnel. And so what I endeavored to do at the very beginning, what got me started was the idea that we were paying a third party to send clicks for specific units directly to them. And so I was at the uh, forefront of the, used car inventory that would go gear make model, which is now standard for everybody, right? But we had basically taken that allocation that we would give to AutoTrader and programmed it in-house and delivered those links to our units because the human side of it couldn't be done. So I think what I would say is every business model over time finds scale, right? Either through competitors or through profit or through, gosh, government 
regulation. Regulation. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I th I think what what's happening is, and even Google for that matter. So let's put them in a third party camp as well. At that point, they were a faster way to get directly to people to our website, and there were huge advantages at that point to buying make model campaigns even on new right because the clicks were so cheap but now the clicks get too expensive and now the inventory goes down and now there are other options that are out there so i think it's inevitable the descaling of third parties just like there is a descaling of broadcast tv mm -hmm. now do mm -hmm. you have hulu and do you have netflix yeah disney netflix. yeah my fun game is to take the over under on when netflix is going to start advertising because they will right disney oh, yeah. subscribers just went past Netflix in about a year and a half. Why? Yeah, they did. Because Disney has all this great content. It's very family friendly. They have some cool new Boba Fett stuff. I don't even know what the show is, but y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and now, and now the pressure is going to be on the publicly traded company to come up with an additional revenue stream. So Netflix is locked down that everybody in the family can have one account. So now they've and now they're increasing prices. And then ultimately, they're going to have these limited offers where big companies get to advertise, thus increasing their revenue. So at some point, the third parties are just going to fall victim to technology and scale and competition. Do you, do you ever foresee them um, driving traffic direct to, to, to websites? Could that, I know that would be against their model because then their audiences would, would shrink. And then they can't go out there and be like, well, I have all these views on my website or whatever, or on my platform. But do you think that that would be a way for them to stay relevant? Because they do have an audience there of, of people that are interested in buying cars. I mean, I think a lot of it is higher, a lot higher funnel than we, than we, than we actually think it is in the industry. But um, I think that was the big miss. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I really do. You probably do too. You probably thought that, I mean, you may have even brought that up in a meeting and they're like, shh. Yeah, we exactly. don't say <laughs> yeah. we don't say those things, right, man? And you're like, oh wow, but yeah, why not, right? That would have been because then they would be like they would be in the top ten sources that drive traffic to to a, a, a site, and you could be like, okay, I mean, like you know, forget about BDPs or them submitting leads. Look at all the traffic that we get coming to us from from them. So yeah, man, I, yeah, that would be. I mean. In fact, that's probably a disruptive way to approach it if you were trying to introduce that. And I don't, I don't know where Car Gurus is right now. I don't, you know. But Delix went the way of the dodo. Um, mm -hmm. Auto Trader just achieved such massive scale, and and they have, you know, vertical integrations now that make it difficult for large store groups to move outside of those boundaries. Yeah, and then they, they got the bundling. I mean, that's the one thing yeah. that you know they'll be like, oh, we'll bundle all your products. And so you're like, okay, I mean, if I'm going to be there and it's not going to be twenty thousand dollars a month like it used to be or whatever, then right, sure, why not? But the the attribution is less, less, and less. Um, yeah, and I think we've gone through an automotive like there was a moment in time that we've all lived where tech was a competitive advantage. Now it's a price of entry. Oh, that's such a good way to look at it. Yeah. It is so true. What yeah. do you think? Of, what do you but think about? There's so many people who don't realize that, though. Like desking managers who still use paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think about dealerships? Okay. Do you think that it's wise for dealerships to invest in building their own tech? Or is that you, that's a waste of money? Just go on and buy something that's built that you you bet it and it's you know you can fit yeah. within your parameters or whatever. So you have to ask yourself: Does it scale for your group? Right? Can you do it more efficiently? And so, at a ten or twelve store group, you start having those opportunities present themselves. But you also have to have a great deal of discipline because oftentimes what got you to a 10 or 12 store group was the fact that the individual performers were decentralized and made decisions on their own. So now all of a sudden you're going to tell all these superstars who are great players. Now you're going to do everything on the same page, the way I say it up here at headquarters. So there's like this, the yin and yang and conflict of what it takes to scale is you probably need different people. Once you've scaled, than the people that you had on your way to scaling when you got there. Yeah. Oh my this God, is, this is like that competitive oh. versus cooperative communication thing. 
one of the discussions that Herb and I have had in the past is the problem with that I see with taking your sales, your best salespeople and making them managers is that managers have to cooperative, cooperatively communicate. And that is not the way that sales guys communicate at all. Yeah. That's right. so smart. That's yes. Thing. So true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're yeah. like, protect, protect, protect. And now all of a sudden you want me to tell everybody what. Mm -mm. Yeah. Right. And then it's really hard to communicate between managers because you do the same thing. And I can see that like on a, on a dealer group level. Oof. Yeah. That'd well, Herbs does some of that with the multiple stores you're working with. And when you put mm -hmm. like the grid together, that's competitive metric. They spend so much time talking about how the other person's numbers are not true. I mean, it's, in, it's incredible. And I, yeah. I respect it. Right. But I also am like, is it productive? It's productive if it helps motivate you. Right. But it's not productive if it's making excuses. But so at what point, okay, this is, this might be a good question, maybe not, but at what point does a group have to, because you, in order to get big, in order to have fit, let's just say 50 stores or more, you can't be, okay, we're part of a group, but it's just me, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm, it's my operation. At some point you have not everything, but you got to put things that are, that tie it all together. I mean, at what point are you too big to, to just have a, you know, be a, an individual within a group. I'll, I'll say it this way. Like one of the cool things when you're in a, a smaller group is you have the opportunity to play offense and defense. And I, my analogy there is basketball, but when you get to, because you play, you know, you can score, you can pass, you can rebound, you can play steal defense, block shots, all that. But when you get to like a 50 store group, now you have to have specialists. Now you're more like a football team. Now you only play defense, right? You don't play offense and defense. You're and then with the, the offense or the defense, the offense has specialty people. There is a quarterback, right? There is a running back. There is a wide receiver. And each of those core groups, strangely enough, may not even know. Like if you look at the signals that come in from the sideline, they may not even know if you're a linebacker, your coverage is independent of what the safety and cornerbacks are doing. You only need to know what you need to do, and you need to do it exceedingly well. Right. That's different than the 12-store group where everybody's playing different roles. And when somebody moves on, the controller's covering two stores or, you mm -hmm. know, there's a little bit more relationships involved in that. But when you get to, like, the machine level, like a football team would be, like, think Nick Saban, think Bill Belichick, that's what your publics are like when they're running 60, 70, 100, 200 stores. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I can't even imagine if they, they would never even get to that level without it. It's impossible. It yes. Would be, it would be chaos. <laughs> yeah. So, and the personalities matter less too, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you look like at Saban, I'm a big sports fan, you can tell the stuff in the background. He would, he's fired coaches before national championship games. Lane Kiffin famously mm -hmm. as the offensive coordinator because he wanted to have all this drama about him going to another store, you know, in this case, another college, and he wanted to be a head coach and he wanted to know if he could do recruiting. And Sam was like, look, you got to be on the team. This is the job. You don't want to do the job. Why don't you go do your other job now? The week before a national championship game. And he moved him on. And guys like Saban continue to win. He does have a car dealership to bring it back to a uh, car business. Oh, yeah. That's he, awesome. I think a Mercedes Benz store, I think somewhere in Alabama or Georgia, but cool. uh, yeah, that kind of discipline is what helps football organizations scale. It helps automobile dealerships scale. So yeah. And scale really is what brings growth. Sure. Yeah. Right. And that everybody loves that experience. It's the other side that we don't like so much. Yes, sir. Dude, thank you so much for doing this, man. I really, really appreciate yeah. it. There is uh, one question that I ask everybody that comes on the show, but before I want to, first of all, I want to, I know that you wrote this book a, a, a while back, but still it's a great book. I still find it super mm -hmm. relevant. Um, I actually gave it to charity and said, Hey, if you want to like, you know, learn more marketing in depth, like read this book, read it like three times. I told her like, it's, it's a really, <laughs> really good. Like I really like what, what the stuff that's Thank in there. It, it, it makes a whole lot of sense. So um, we're going to put a link in the show notes. Um, please pick up this book. You won't regret it. It's the best money you ever spent. It's, it's amazing. 
Um, but tell us a little bit about how people can get in touch with you. How can they connect with you? Um, um, you know, let us know how, how to reach out. Yeah, no, for sure. You can reach, you know, you can call me or email me, jim at localsearchgroup.com. My cell number, which I'm happy to give out here is 713-410-1466. I get a lot of calls. So, you know, if you want to text me who you are and give me a heads up, that'll be more helpful because uh, otherwise you're going straight to voicemail if it's a cold call. Just get too <laughs> many too many going on right out there. And, you know, to your point about Cardog million, Millionaire, it's it's been exciting. I know sometimes I go off on tangents and and talk a bit about zoomed out and zoomed in things, but I co-authored the book. I brought somebody in who has done work as a stand-up comedian. So it's a much lighter touch to the dialogue that we have. And it is very relevant to not only automotive retail still today, right? Structurally, if I were getting started, I'd say these are the things you should do. And it's withstood the test of time. So thank you for saying that. But it's also helpful for other people in the marketing community. I've worked at Nike and Toyota, so been classically trained, but also have been fire tested at the retail level and really enjoy the competition that comes from helping your clients win. And wins to me are helping them be more profitable, gain more market share, and really outmaneuvering the competition. So I and I appreciate you do much of the same thing. And I appreciate you having me on the show with both of you today. Thank you. Thanks, man. Um, Thank we're you. gonna put all of Jim's information that's available to us in the show notes. So if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, go to the video description. Everything's going to be there. Or if you're listening to this, wherever you get your podcast, podcast fix, go to the show notes of that of this episode, and you can get that information there. Um, Jim, you also do a podcast too, right? I've listened to it. I do. I I have yes. It's Automotive Advertising Podcast. We we have several thousand subscribers on on our channel, we actually do help clients monetize their channels so that, I mean, it's crazy when YouTube actually pays you. So <laughs> if you're, and if, if you or anyone else wants to talk about that, I'm happy to, you know, talk about that on a separate episode or offline uh, with you or others, however best helps the community grow faster together. Right on. Yeah. So we'll make sure to link that there too. I've, I've, I've caught several of the episodes, really good stuff. And I like the format because it's like, you know, 15, 20 minute a session, but they get right to the point. Um, so um, if you're looking for that dosage of, uh, uh, is it dosage or doses? Dosage, right? Dosage, dosage yeah. Of knowledge, um, you can get your fix pretty, pretty quickly. Um, dude, thank you again so much for doing this. Uh, I really appreciate having you here. Um, My there pleasure. Is a question I ask. Yeah. Thanks. There is one question that I ask everybody that comes on the show. And that question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years and why? In five years, I I look to two people, believe it or not, to help set the course. One of them is going to be Jim Farley out of Ford. And I'm going to say, you know, I was going to say Elon Musk is probably the other. So those are kind of the two personalities that drive at the top. So they can give you an indication of how big this EV thing is going to be. But I'll also tell you that guys like Jack Hollis and Andrew Gilliland at Toyota are going to be big players. So I, I guess what I'm really saying is that OEMs are going to be critically important product wins in my mind. I know operations is huge. I love helping dealers out execute. But in five years, I think we'll still be less than 20% of the market in electric vehicles. So that'll be the thing that we'll see because all the other scripts would tell you it'd be much, much higher. So I get how important EVs are, but I would say I'm more bearish than bullish in terms of the progression. Right. On. I think that's spot on. I've had that conversation with a lot of people as of late, and I just don't see that um, the infrastructure and all that. It's just the know. finances come into play. Internal combustion yeah. engines are so less expensive. Right. For sure. So anyways, um, Jim, thanks again for doing this, man. Really appreciate it. Um, folks, thank you again for tuning in. Um, you know, we're super excited to be back with season seven. This is a great episode. Thank you so much. And as usual, we'll talk later. We only host the well respected. The vendor Lexus Nexus. We don't sell digital marketing. What you do? We inspected what our DT vendor management. 
Now more than ever, businesses need more efficient sales. That's why thousands of dealerships trust Four Eyes to help with things like automated inventory email updates and ensuring all of your leads get into the CRM. To try Four Eyes for free, visit foureyes.io slash dealertalk. That's foureyes.io slash dealertalk.